to Mark. Glory to you, Lord God. Jesus took Peter and James and John to a high mountain where they could be alone. And there Jesus was transfigured before their eyes. The clothes Jesus wore became dazzling white, whiter than any earthly bleach could make them. Elisha appeared to them, as did Moses, and the two were walking with Jesus. Then Peter spoke to Jesus. Rabbi, he said, how wonderful it is for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what he was saying, so overcome they, were, they all were with awe. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and there came a voice out from the cloud. This is my beloved, my own. Listen to this one. Then suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, only Jesus. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the promised one had risen from the dead. They agreed to this, though they discussed among themselves what rising from the dead could mean. The Good News of Salvation <laughs> Consecrate our lives to our great good and to your greater glory. Amen. Amen. I've always found the Transfiguration a strange and compelling story. Jesus takes three disciples up to a high mountain, which marks a liminal place, an in between place, if you will, between heaven and earth. The text tells us that he is transfigured before them. His clothes become luminous, and Moses and Elijah appear to speak with him. God's voice comes from behind a cloud, naming Jesus as God's Son. Yet the transformation, this transfiguration, is transient. Moses and Elijah disappear, along with the holy glow. And on the descent, Jesus tells his disciples not to tell anyone what had happened until after Jesus is resurrected. It's a story of contradictions, a moment of sublime mystery and intimate secrecy, of partial revelation of now and not yet. Since the Transfiguration prefigures the full disclosure of Jesus' divinity through the resurrection and ascension, it is, in James Miller's words, a key moment of transition, a transformative moment in which a fragment of divine truth is disclosed. With all its distilled drama, the Transfiguration is a synecdote, a microcosm for the life of Jesus as a whole, the mystery and magic of divine embodiment, of the Creator dwelling with creation. Or, as in the book of John, which eschews the Transfiguration story for a bunch of poetic pronouncements, the Word becoming flesh. In the Transfiguration, we see the exaltation of Jesus in his fleshy body, his earthy and earthly body, his body that touched those deemed untouchable, fed the hungry, restored the reviled, and rebuked the rich, his human body that felt hungry, tender, and weary, 
his political body, a brown-skinned ethnic minority living under marginalized imperial occupation. Before the Cartesian mind-body split, before Constantine and Christian supremacy, before colonial racial hierarchies and scientific rationalism, Jesus shows us what one theologian calls the sacrament of bodies. That our bodies are sites for healing, for meaning-making, for transformation, in other words, for salvation. God does not meet us in some otherworldly plane out there, but in our bodies. God meets us in our sore backs and in our bandaging of bruised knees and our roughened hands and our weary bodies post Pilates class. <laughs> God meets us in our dry skin after we've done the dishes. God meets us in the realness of who we are. God meets us in the transitioning and transforming of our bodies through age and gender and birth and illness and even death. And knowing and attending to our bodies and the bodies of others is holy work. Bless the tender bodies, the transitioning bodies, the intersex bodies, the non-binary bodies, bless those bodies longing for touch, bless the bodies lonely and alone, bless the bodies that live between worlds. In the Anglican tradition, which is where I come from, the traditional rite Eucharistic prayer from the Book of Common Prayer says, we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. A sacrifice to God, a sacrifice to and for love itself. We are called to love with our bodies just as Christ loved us with his own earthly body by offering himself on the cross by offering himself to us at this altar, day by day and week by week, in the sacrament of his body and blood. Holy food for holy people, a foretaste of the divine, so that we may go out and do the work that we're called to do, the work of radical, unconditional, self-sacrificial love. Here at this altar, we are transformed. We are transfigured, if you will, just like Jesus, into something even more radiant and holy. But just like Jesus, we too must come down from the mountaintop and go back into the chaos of the world and do the work that we're called to do. To bring light, which can overshadow any darkness, to offer ourselves, our bodies, our time, our physical presence, to those who need to experience love in whatever form that may take. Even if it's just listening for a few moments to what someone else has to say. This Lenten season, may we strive to approach this altar not for solace only, but for strength. Not for pardon only, but for renewal so that we may go out from this place healed, restored, and renewed to do the work that Christ calls us to do. God meets us in our sore backs and our bandaging of bruised knees and our roughened hands. God meets us in the places that we least expect in places where resurrection seems impossible, yet we know the story of the cross, and we know that story doesn't end there. We know that the impossible can become a reality when we least expect it. And we know that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Or in the words of a pastor friend of mine, weeping may, but joy will. You can be 
that joy for someone this Lent. You can be that joy for someone as soon as you walk out these doors, or maybe even before them. You can be the sacramental body in this world. We can all let the grace of God that flows through us inebriate the bodies and souls of those that we meet on the journey that is light. We can love without boundaries. We can be beacons of hope and resurrection to those broken, weary bodies who feel that resurrection is impossible. This is our call. May God give us the grace to live. Amen.